morning, everybody. I am um, suffering from a cold. The advice of my daughter this morning was to man up. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to try to do in, in giving you this presentation. I was reminded, actually, uh, just in terms of my background, a glowing uh, introduction there. Thank you, Lord dear. Uh, I actually uh, also was Chief Executive of Job Centre Plus and now work, for, uh, work in the private sector. Uh, when I was in Luton and Ealing, I chaired the Crime and Disorder Reduction Partnerships and actually had a very close working relationship with uh, the police at a strategic and a need an operational level, uh, which I think is absolutely essential because in my view, and I'm sure you will agree, re reducing crime, fighting crime, reducing and uh, dealing with the fear of crime is not just a job of the police, it's a job of many, many different <coughs> public service uh, partners, including uh, local authorities. Reminded also of one story, uh, Simon mentioned traffic wardens. I was on my way to Luton one morning about 7 o'clock and I got a phone call. Uh, somebody had handcuffed themselves to the railings uh, just as you enter Luton Town Hall, or the entrance that was used at the time anyway. And uh, when I got there, the police were there, obviously the, the police negotiator successfully managed uh, to convince uh, this individual not to uh, cut his wrist with a rather vicious looking knife. Um, and a couple of hours after he'd been taken away, I got a call from the borough commander saying that the police negotiator who had driven to Luton Town Centre had got a parking ticket. <laughs> and could I deal with it? So that's the only time I've actually dealt with a parking ticket in that way. So what I want to do is, uh, he says quickly, um, <laughs> and I think that was legitimate. Uh, I just want to make some introductory remarks, if I can get this to work. Um, Policing inevitably was a very strong uh, area of comment uh, it, during our work at the Rights and Vic Vic Communities and Victims panel. It was a key issue for us because not only did communities that we talked to, professionals that we talked to, have a view, everybody had a view about the immediate response of police services in different parts of the country, but also there were concerns raised with us about deeper seated, more fundamental challenges uh, for police service and for the rest of uh, public services as a whole. So the rights panel, four of us, uh, we never claimed to be experts in operational policing. That wasn't our background. But actually what we did here uh, significantly through uh, our seven months of activity were quite a lot of comments about uh, trust, around accountability, around engagement of the police service, which we tried to reflect accurately, or we did reflect accurately in our final report, which was published uh, in March. And I think we accepted as a panel that it's the nature of policing, I, think, I suppose it always has been, but particularly uh, as uh, the spotlight as 24-7 use, as, as uh, different methods of communication uh, improve. It's the nature of policing that you're the first, or police service, the first in line uh, when traumatic and disruptive events occur, but also the first in line uh, for that critical review, that examination post an event as to how it went, how it was handled and actually what the causes were. So we were clear to that we wanted to acknowledge first of all the bravery of individual police officers, of specials and of PCSOs. I mean we heard stories about Whiteley Shopping Centre in, uh, in uh, West London, in Bayswater I believe it is, uh, which actually was defended uh, by a group of PCSOs uh, from attack from a, a, a very a vicious mob on one of the nights during those five uh, days in August. We accepted that um, the police do a tough job and I think actually in the nature of the, these particular riots, the, the pace at which they spread, I think has just got a bit tougher. Uh, and we also actually accepted that the, the relationship between the public and the police, in this instance, I don't think was the, the single cause of the riots. Uh, for some people, it did contribute to their uh, willingness to attack uh, the police and to attack uh, 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 shops and, uh, and other establishments and I'll come on to that but as I say some of the things we heard actually concerned us because that relationship with, between the public and the police is easily corroded uh, and, uh, and, and actually a negative impact, negative contact, poor communication, lack of transparency and other issues actually eat away at that relationship which is so essential. So let me just remind you um, about s some of the things that happened. I won't dwell on this slide for, for, for too long. Uh, we found in our research uh, that up to about 15,000 people had actively participated in rioting, in looting, in causing damage uh, over those five days. Tragically, five people died, three in Birmingham, 
uh, and elsewhere in London. Uh, the economic and total financial cost is difficult uh, to um, uh, establish, but uh, the figure is there in terms of one of the assessments. And also there's some statistics on that slide about the number of people who were arrested and the number of crimes and the areas uh, that were covered. And actually I think the riots, again I'll repeat, were unique in terms of their scale and speed at which they spread from Tottenham initially uh, through the rest of London and up uh, into the Midlands, uh, Greater Manchester and elsewhere. So in response to the riots, um, the, Deputy, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the Official op Opposition established the panel and we were asked to look at the, the bullet points or the areas which are mentioned on that slide, and particularly to undertake our work from the perspective of communities, not necessarily from the perspective of professionals or academics or think tanks, however all of their views did matter of course, but to particularly specifically engage with, with communities. So we visited about 26 different areas during our work, including some areas where there, were no, uh, there was no rioting, such as Sheffield, Luton, Bradford uh, and uh, Newcastle, but also the kind of major uh, locations where there were dis disturbances. We also undertook uh, a number of exercises to talk to uh, people who had a view. Um, and in our report in March, uh, we uh, focus specifically on the longer term, more deeper seated issues, having dealt with some of the immediate factors that were, that were in play uh, in terms of the rioting uh, uh, in our report in November last year. And as part of our final report, we actually commissioned uh, Ipsos Mori to undertake a survey in six neighbourhoods, uh, four of which um, uh, suffered uh, riots and two of which that didn't. And this comes back to a point I think Simon uh, alluded to, which is it's all v fair and well looking at averages in terms of what the police, sorry, what the public think of the police and the nature of that relationship. Well, one needs to think about the outliers, um, particularly actually where, pe where those numbers and statistics drop well below uh, those averages. And I think there are, kind of, on this slide, what I'm trying to get across to you is there's some significant challenges, not only just for the police, but also for other public services, uh, including uh, local uh, government, uh, in terms of actually the views of uh, individuals in some areas about the, the nature of their relationship and confidence in public services. Yeah. In terms of our key findings, um, we, uh, on our, of our final report, we focus on th six uh, themes and six, six areas. Uh, the last one being the, uh, the police and the public. And I just want to put this slide up to put my remarks in context. Uh, we did focus on children and parents and, and the nature uh, of difficulties and challenges faced by some uh, young people and some parents. We did actually, and this is different from Scarman and other reviews, I was actually also a member of the Community Cohesion Review Team, which was led by Ted Cantler, which reported on the riots in Bradford, Burnley and Oldham back in 2001. And where we differ here in our work is that we focus a, 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 to some extent on character uh, and personal resilience. We talked about aspiration and ambition. Brands, uh, particularly as you know, a, a lot of the writers went after uh, high-end brands, tracksuits, trainers, uh, uh, electrical goods and so on. Uh, we focus on the criminal justice system in terms of its effectiveness uh, in t uh, with regard to reducing reoffending, and we focused uh, on the police. So I just want to concentrate on the sixth area there. Um, and these are the themes that emerged in our conversations uh, with, uh, with individuals, um, with communities, with young people, with older people, with community representatives, as well as what I may describe as, as ordinary residents who are not particularly engaged in any, any single process. And I think all of these uh, points, trust, communication, the uh, nature of contact with the police, between the public and the police, accountability and integrity, all add up to that word that's been quoted and used already, which is legitimacy. Uh, and to just unpack this a bit further, with respect to trust, uh, the, what we pointed out in our report, and we build upon the research and evidence that's already available that most of you uh, will probably be familiar with, that actually uh, trust in policing is vital in terms of fighting crime and reducing the fear of crime, is vital in terms of uh, developing cooperation 
between members of uh, between members of the public uh, and the police, and is essentially helping to break down those barriers. Essentially, what we found is that too many people in some parts of the country. Uh, felt that actually that, that there were no shared values between themselves and the police, that the police were not on the same side of those individuals. And the way this came through most starkly was actually in terms of stop and search. So um, a story, I went to um, Tottenham, one of my visits to Tottenham, met a young uh, black man there who uh, must have been 19, 20, who had been stopped 40 times, uh, he claimed. Um, and uh, on none of those occasions was uh, anything found on him. He accepted that stop and search was important. He didn't want people on the streets who had knives and guns that endangered his life, his safety and the safety of his family and friends, but actually he was absolutely livid by the way in which that contact had been handled. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, I can repeat other stories um, uh, 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 similar to that, but actually I think that is quite important. Stop and search has been an issue in terms of how it's been uh, uh, implemented for some years and we still haven't actually got it, got it right. Uh, so that, uh, an issue around trust, uh, is particularly uh, important and the way those encounters are handled can either add to uh, the public's confidence in the police or uh, be corrosive. Integrity. Uh, we base uh, some comments in our, in our report on research that's already been undertaken. And again, where, the, where this kind of came to the fore was immediately after the shooting of Mark Duggan. You may remember there were rumours circulating about uh, why that had happened, the circumstances, whether, and whether or not this was yet another uh, example of, um, uh, of uh, what one person called uh, was an execution, is the term they used. Um, and um, again, we come back to the point that actually integrity and communication and trust are all linked uh, to each other and that vacuum allowed rumours to spread and those rumours spread and took hold because of a lack of confidence of some members of communities in actually how the police uh, dealt with uh, their concerns uh, in the past. The third point on this slide around contact with the police uh, again uh, shows actually uh, demonstrates my point about getting away from averages, thinking about kind of a, the quality of contact and individual members of the public's views of contact from their perspective. So b black and minority ethnic groups have uh, a, a worse view uh, than their white counterparts in terms of quality uh, of that contact. And in our neighbourhood survey, one in four of the people who'd had recent contact with the police were unhappy about the way they were treated. In terms of communication, um, and I guess this again plays into the point that's already been made, which is not just about what the police do, or the police and their partners do, it's actually about uh, how that is explained um, and um, uh, what um, uh, 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 the reasoning behind, how the reasoning behind, forgive me, uh, particular decisions, policing tactical decisions, are explained to the public. So when we visited Croydon and uh, Haringey, there was a strong view there, particularly from some of the victims, if you go to Croydon along the London Road, that they were abandoned by the police during the riots. That certain parts of the town centre were focused on, but actually their shops, their homes were not. Now I think a critical challenge there is uh, an ongoing challenge, I think, in terms of regaining public confidence from that particular group uh, uh, within those areas and others, is to explain why and continue to explain why those decisions uh, were, were taken. Social media, Simon's talked very eloquently about social media. We were very impressed by uh, some examples we saw. There's a, a, a superintendent, uh, forgive me, I'm not very good on, uh, uh, on, on status within the police force. I just know who the chiefs are and, uh, and work my way down kind of thing. But a superintendent... No, no, not on this occasion. It was a, a woman from Sheffield who actually, uh, a police officer who was uh, very good, had a, her own tweet, uh, Twitter account. There was a rumour circulating that um, uh, people were going to gather outside uh, TJ Hughes, I think it is, in the city centre in Sheffield. Does anybody know Sheffield very well here? Uh, and actually she was able to respond immediately on her, using her Twitter account and tweeted, one, there was nobody gathering, and uh, I don't know if you can do this under 42 characters, and secondly, that actually if anybody did turn up, they would be dealt with. 
so to speak. So uh, actually, she kind of knocked that one, uh, 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 dealt with that one very effectively. Now, there's lots of other examples in Greater Manchester GMP uh, of, of police officers using uh, Twitter very effectively, and, and so I actually support very much what Simon uh, said. Community engagement. Now, um, we were told that actually in the days before the disturbances in Tottenham, that the uh, community uh, intelligence was telling the local police uh, uh, force that actually um, uh, tension was uh, low. And I think one of the points, or a number of the points that came across to us was that the mechanisms that police use to engage with communities need to be refreshed constantly. Um, and particularly to ensure that uh, more relevant voices or relevant voices are being heard and that actually the voices uh, of young people and the perspectives of young people are included. So uh, uh, community reference groups or whatever, uh, IAGs and so on, uh, need to uh, be uh, uh, kind of revitalised on a regular basis. And finally, on accountability, we talked a lot about confidence in the complaints procedures uh, and the statistics in the report about, uh, about uh, uh, that, um, particularly and the number of people who don't make a complaint. And I think one of the kind of key um, elements of accountability is that confidence. When you feel that something hasn't been handled well, are you confident that you can make a complaint and that complaint will be handled effectively, either by the police or by IPCC. So in terms of our recommendations, uh, we uh, essentially kind of, they mirror the, the, our findings. I made a whole range of recommendations around integrity and community engagement about the need to continually engage directly with their community. I'm told, actually, that the fourth bridge is no longer painted. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But when it used to be painted, I would have used the, if I could have stepped back 20 years or whatever, I would have used that analogy, which is it's constantly uh, like painting the fourth bridge. And I don't think, actually, this is something that you can ever stop doing. It's, it's like communication. You have to keep going at it and going at it and going at it and looking at how that can be improved. Um, I think uh, we, uh, we should actually give greater recognition to those uh, police officers, particularly in terms of advance in their advancement, who actually give uh, excellent performance in terms of community uh, relationships. Social media I've talked about uh, and um, transparency has also been mentioned. Uh, trust hotspots. Um, from my days back in Luton and Ealing, we looked at confidence in the police at a local authority wide level and that was a mistake actually um, and I, I realize at the time and now realize that at the time we should have been focused on those areas where there's a particular deficit in terms of trust between co uh, the police and the public and that's what we encourage uh, uh, all police services to do uh, in, in our recommendations and then in terms of accountability our, uh, our recommendation essentially focused around uh, dealing with complaints and systems for recording complaints and also responding to complaints from members of the public, whether those are complaints that are dealt with by local police services or indeed by uh, the IPCC. <coughs> so finally, one year on, um, Police and Crime Commissioners, uh, are, the previous speakers have talked eloquently about Police and Crime Commissioners. The point I suppose I would exhort new police and crime commissioners to, to focus on. One is to learn the lessons that we've kind of identified across all those six themes in our report. Uh, and secondly, actually, some people voiced to us concern that in, in this kind of strategic policing requirement assessments, that some of the... Uh, what really helped, actually, was the um, uh, mutual aid provisions between forces across the country and that actually we shouldn't lose or detract from the, that commitment to mutual aid to deal with very disruptive and traumatic events of, of the nature that we saw last August. Stop and Search, um, HMIC uh, are uh, undertaking a review of Stop and Search, ACPO are also looking at this. I think we need to continually come back to Stop and Search to look at how effective it is first of all in terms of reducing crime but also more importantly how it is effectively discharged to help to build public confidence rather than erode it. And again this point of every minor encounter matters in this respect. 
Um, and some other initiatives which I think are, are important, Troubled Families Programme and Community Budgets offers us an opportunity to think about some of these lessons and how as public services across the piece we may be able to respond in terms of uh, better use of our resources. I know police forces are, are active in community budgets. The, uh, the Chief Constable of Essex, for example, is very active in the Essex pilot. Um, and then on the right, Damages Act, there's a review of how that is uh, being dealt with and uh, uh, delivered uh, to ensure that we get compensation to uh, those individuals who suffer as a result uh, of these kinds of incidents. So, thank you very much.